Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. So, Dr. Nan, I'd like to start off by just getting some uh, general background on things. Uh, for example, this is all about matter, and I'm not sure we understand fully what that is now that we have a selection of matter, dark matter and, and baryonic matter and so on. And so what is matter? Okay, so. I knew you were going to ask me this, huh. so I looked it up, and the Oxford English Dictionary says matter is that which occupies space and possesses rest mass. Okay, that doesn't which help. Which doesn't me. help at all, <laughs> right? right? Okay. So um, what I think of as as what is matter, uh, I kind of think about. Uh, I at one time I had young children, and they like to build with Legos, and they would build all sorts of creations yeah. out of these basic building blocks. And you know, so they would take a couple Legos and stack them all up and make a beautiful house or a Star Wars character or something, right? Um, and and so matter is sort of nature's Legos, and what we're trying to find out is what the most fundamental Legos are, right? Pretty much our everyday world, people know. Well, what are you made of? Your mm -hmm. skin and bone. Mm -hmm. Well, what are skin and bone? Well, that's certain kind of molecules. Molecules are made up of different kinds of atoms, like mostly carbon, and water is H two O. That's two atoms of hydrogen and one atom yeah. of oxygen, right? So atoms then are made of protons and neutrons. Uh, that makes up the nucleus and electrons, which mm -hmm. circle around the nucleus in funny ways. And that the way they interact gives you all of chemistry and chemistry gives you mm -hmm. biology mm -hmm. and biology gives you us. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to figure out, is there anything smaller than those protons and neutrons and electrons, the stuff that we think makes up everyday matter? And we've known, actually, for about 45 years that indeed mm. there are smaller constituents of matter. Mm. And they are the subatomic particles. So in fact, the electron does not seem to have any smaller subcomponent. But the proton yeah. and the neutron, this is what we found out a while ago, 45 years ago, the proton and the neutron are made of things called quarks. So this is really what the, the goal of fundamental particle physics is after. It's what are the you know, most fundamental building blocks mm -hmm, of nature. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that there are, there's a, a, a very easy, it, it sounds complicated, right? Fundamental particle physics sounds complicated. <laughs> but it's actually very straightforward. There are essentially 12 things which make up mm. matter. There are six things called quarks, and there are six things called leptons. The quarks are the up and down quark, the charm and strange quark, and the top and bottom quark. And it's Two ups quarks and a down quark make a proton. One up quark and two down quarks make a neutron. That plus the electron gives you everyday matter, right? Um, and the electron, its neutrino, and the two quarks make up what we call the first generation. Mm -hmm. Then there are two more generations, which are almost carbon copies of the first one, except they're a little bit heavier. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know why there are two more generations. Mm -hmm. We don't really need them to make up everyday, our everyday world. They seem to be there. We don't know why there's not yet another extra generation. So those are the kind of questions we're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. Is this all there is, mm -hmm. or could there be more? Mm -hmm. Now, there's another piece of the puzzle that you have to understand, which is if you just have a bunch of stuff laying there and it doesn't interact, it's not very interesting. Mm -hmm. So how this matter interacts is mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. piece of what we study. Mm -hmm. And we talk about this in terms of forces. Right? And people actually have heard about forces. Right, There's right. electromagnetism, right? And that has a particular force carrier. So when we talk about electricity, really at the fundamental level, we're talking about some charged electron emitting a photon, mm -hmm. which interacts with a proton over here. Mm -hmm. And that interaction makes the force. Mm -hmm. There are other forces that we know about, though. There's the strong force. So the strong force is what separates those quarks 
from the gluon, or sorry, excuse me, mm -hmm. the strong force mm -hmm. is what separates those quarks from the leptons, and it's what holds the proton together, holds the neutron together, and holds them tightly in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And it has to be stronger than the electromagnetic force because otherwise the protons would all fly apart. Mm -hmm. So that's why we call it strong. Mm -hmm. There's the weak force. So the weak force is the force that's responsible for certain radiative decays. And its force carriers are the W and Z. I should have said the force carrier for the strong force is the gluon. Mm. And then the force carriers for the weak force are the W boson and Z bosons. So there's this stuff and there's those three forces that interact. There's actually a fourth force that everybody knows about. It's kind of funny, actually. It's gravity, of course, right? Um, everybody knows about gravity, but we don't talk about gravity mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. in fundamental particle physics because it's not really part of the subatomic world. To feel gravity, you need something the size of a planet yeah. to pull on you to feel it. And even mm -hmm. that's not that strong, right? We can, you know, use magnets to levitate people. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we don't have or magnets the size of planets. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. So gravity doesn't play a very big role, mm -hmm. and we kind of ignore it mm -hmm. uh, for fundamental particle physics. Okay. Now, if we get this matter, then your big finding this year, the Higgish, mm -hmm. is the the Higgish is then uh, has to do with the mass, and so where does the mass come from in that case, and why is this an issue? Why don't these things just stick together the way they're supposed to? Mm. Well, we have to be a little careful about what we talk about when we really mean mass. So there's yeah. sort of three effective definitions of mass. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, sorry. Well, it all sort of makes sense and it hangs together yeah, if you think about right, it for right. a while, but it takes a little bit, so we'll go slow. Yes, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so first of all, Newton came up with the idea of mass is the stuff which keeps you from slowing down quickly or keeps you from speeding up quickly. It's called inertial mass, yeah, okay. right? If you push on something with a certain force, it accelerates, but it, if it's really heavy, has lots of mass, it doesn't accelerate very mm -hmm. much. If it's very light, it has very little mass and it accelerates a lot. Okay. So there's inertial mass and that okay. goes with this famous Newton's formula, F force equals mass times acceleration, yeah. which, well, if you've ever taken one of my classes in classical <laughs> mechanics, you better have learned. Okay, I so, learned this one. <laughs> <laughs> that one people may be familiar with. The second form of mass, which Newton also figured out with a big hint from Kepler, is mass is sort of the source of the gravitational force. Right? Mm -hmm. Objects pull on each other with the gravitational force according to how big their mass is. And the fact that the gravitational mass is the same as the inertial mass is, it, it's what we call the equivalence principle. We call it a principle because we don't really know why that is, but mm -hmm. it seems to be mm -hmm. true. And mm -hmm. if you think about it, that's what Galileo showed us when he took a big heavy thing and a light thing and he dropped them from the Tower of Pisa and they fell at the same rate. That's because since the gravitational mass on this side equals the inertial mass on that side, the mass cancels out and it doesn't matter. Right. If it's heavier light, it still falls at the same rate. Okay. So that's the second kind of mass. The third kind of mass. Drum roll. Yes, is the mass we're talking about. <laughs> yes. And this is the mass that our friend Albert Einstein gave us, okay. right? This is the other physics formula that everybody probably Better learn. knows, right? <laughs> e equals mc squared. Okay. It says that a particle or a hunk of matter, even when it's not moving, has a certain amount of energy okay. called its rest mass. And this is the mass that we are dealing with in fundamental uh, uh, particle physics. Now, I have to be really careful about this now, and this is the thing that people don't really get right away. Quark 2 plus quark 3 mm -hmm. gives you the mass of the proton. Mm -hmm. That's actually a very small component of the mass of the proton. So when we say talk about this rest mass, we're really only talking about the mass of the quarks and the mass of the leptons and the mass of the force carriers. We're not talking about the mass of the proton or the neutron. Um, so it's, it's tricky because mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. mass in the form of the interaction mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there's mass just, I the rest mass is just sitting Good, there. Good, yeah. Okay, so the big problem, so we have this standard model of particle physics and we've tested, we've tested it so much over the last 40 years and it always comes out with flying colors. It's actually mm -hmm. a little bit depressing for an experimentalist. <laughs> That's right, you get tired of that. You get tired <laughs> of confirming the theory all the time. <laughs> However, it has some problems. And one of the problems it has is that y what it does is it predicts uh, the probability for a certain event to happen. And it, if you allow these quarks and leptons and these, these force carriers to have mass, then at some extreme extrapolation of the theory, it predicts probabilities bigger than one. Uh -huh. Right. So the theory says either those things cannot have mass mm -hmm. or 
it doesn't make any sense at some extrapolation, right? So that's a problem for theories. They should make sense all the time, mm -hmm. otherwise they're not a very mm -hmm. sound theory. Mm -hmm. um, and this Higgs mechanism was invented precisely to fix this problem, to be able to have a self-consistent theory but to allow those particles to have mass, because we know they do. We, we've measured it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we know they must have mass somehow, and that's what this Higgs does. But it requires one new particle that we hadn't found. And maybe we still haven't found, but we can get mm -hmm. to that a little mm -hmm. bit later. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to add a new particle, and then you say, well, the, the theory says there should be this particle there, and then you build experiments to go look for it. And this summer, we came up with evidence for a new particle that fits the description mm -hmm, of a Higgs, mm -hmm. right? But we haven't quite verified all of the details yet, mm -hmm. right? It looks like it's in the right spot. It would make the theory happy, but we have to make sure that it has the right properties that a Higgs boson should have. Um, in particular, it should be a spin zero particle, and uh -huh. it should actually couple to mass. Okay, and, and it has to be some size, in some size range? Well, I wouldn't that, say a size, well, it has to, you know what I mean. It has to live in a certain yeah. range. Its mass itself has to be larger than what we searched so, so far, because we right, haven't seen it, right. but it has to be smaller than a certain amount, otherwise the theory breaks down again. Uh, okay. So it has to be within this range, and that's the great thing about the LHC, is we knew when we built this accelerator that we should be able to explore that whole range. Right. So we'd say, well, either we find this thing, yeah. or it's not there, and we have to you know, go back to theory and try to figure out some other explanation for this. Or get a bigger collider. <laughs> well, no, no, that's the point. Oh, oh it for should be able to do it. For this particular one, okay. we can see the whole range. Uh, we don't need a bigger okay. collider right. at this point, okay. which is very different than other theories. Other, uh, for instance, m inventing more particles, you could always, they could always have too much mass and we don't have enough energy to create yes. those. But this right. Higgs one, either we find it, I see. or we get to throw the theory away and try something new. That would be fun. Okay, so then this makes matter possible. This, this is like a field yes. to, to, to provide mass. Otherwise, yes. it, it wouldn't be sticking together. Is, yes. is that it's the idea? It's what we get it. say, the mass of the electron is because of the way it couples with the Higgs. Okay, and there are two things very quickly here. Then there are some particles, evidently, that don't have mass or have such minimal vanishing mass that uh, they, it doesn't make sense. How did they escape from having mass? <laughs> <laughs> what happened well, to them? Okay, so there's, there's, I think, two particles you're alluding to. One are neutrinos, and for a long time, we thought neutrinos had no mass right. because we couldn't measure it. But recently, recently means in the last, say, 20 years, mm -hmm. um, we have found that neutrino, neutrinos do have mass. And we found this through uh, a, a unique phenomenon in particle physics called neutrino mixing, where one kind of neutrino, say a muon neutrino, mm -hmm. can turn into a tau kind of neutrino. And they can only do this if they have mass. So since we've oh. seen them do this, we know that they must have some mass, That's even though we can't measure right. it. Right. That's very um, interesting. I didn't realize that it was because of that conversion. Yeah, yeah. That because of the con the, yeah. That's how right. we can know that they have mass. Now, the, the, the flag bearer yes. for massless particles <laughs> is the photon. Yeah. Now it's so special in photon, so many ways, yes, which is the force carrier of electromagnetism. Yeah. Yes, and it brings us yes. the light from the sun, which That's is a very right. good thing for here on Earth. <laughs> so the photon is um, it's a trick though, because in fact this Higgs mechanism, it was known that okay this Z boson and this W boson they have large mass, but it was known that the photon didn't have mass. So. The theory has to fit the experimental evidence, mm -hmm. and the Higgs mechanism is specifically built to leave the photon massless. Ah. So it, it's part of the theory, and it's actually a very detailed part of the theory of exactly how this works that preserves the masslessness of the photon while giving those other force carriers mass. Ah. So it's kind of like the fix is in for the yes, photon. Yes, exactly. I understand now. I, I, all is clear. Is that, okay, wow. Surprising. Got okay. Usually course. it takes a couple times. <laughs> through this now. <laughs> um, so you get this massive collider. Then how does that work? How does it create these, uh, these 
scatterings. Mm -hmm. So accelerators are nothing new. And um, actually, almost everybody up until 10 years ago had an accelerator in their living room. They didn't know it as part of their TV. A cathode ray tube is a, yeah. an accelerator that shoots electrons at phosphors and makes your TV light up, at least until the era of plasmas and such. Um, however, those accelerators don't go to very high energy. We need an accelerator that goes to the very highest energy we can get because you know, you remember from Einstein's famous equation, okay. E equals mc squared. We're looking for something with very large m, very big mass. Yeah. You need very high energy. So when you have high energy particles, they also have lots of momentum. And you have to, in a circular accelerator, you have to bend them around. So something with very high momentum, it's hard to bend. Mm -hmm. So it helps you to have a very large tunnel so they don't have to bend so fast to go around in a circle. And that's why we have this 27 kilometer circumference Large Hadron Collider, which can accelerate particles eventually up to the highest energy, which is 14 tera electron volts. And so now it's not generating that speed right now, but at the or moment that energy, it started it just, at seven, yeah, and then it moved up to eight to eight tera electron volts, um, and then we're going to have a little shutdown for about 20 months at the end of this year, actually, sort of next January, I guess, or February. Uh, where we actually install some, some more instrumentation so that we can make that step up to 14 TV confidently. And then look out, right? All and the lights will go well, out. Well, who for knows? <laughs> if there's a new particle that we can't quite reach at 8 right. TV. Yes, right. As soon as we get to 13 or 14, we may suddenly say, hey, we got something new again. And yes. everybody gets excited. Well, since you're on that, then could this go on uh, like exponentially? <laughs> that you well, could just there's build only larger and larger and larger. Yeah. You're, you're sort colliders? of fixed by the radius of your tunnel, yes. how big your tunnel is, right. because if you try to put too much energy, it won't make the curve anymore. And, and the strength <laughs> at which you can make the curve. Yeah. And that is related to the magnetic fields. Okay. So actually, the magnets in the LHC are run at 1.9 degrees Kelvin. That's 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. And they are 8 Tesla, which is very, very strong. Yeah. Um, and, and they are actually you know, part of the limitation of how well, how, to what energy we can go to. Right. Is there any way that you could make a linear yes. kind of collider? Absolutely. Is there any advantage to one or the other? Yes, there is. So um, with a circular collider, you get the advantage of recycling, right? You get mm -hmm. several passes where they can collide at particular points where you put detectors to do the measurements of the physics. Uh, for a linear collider, you only get one pass. Yes. On the other hand, in the case of linear, you don't lose so much energy when you're accelerating. So it, it sounds funny to lose energy yes, while you're accelerating, right, right. but there's some maximum amount you can push. And in circular accelerator, that maximum is less. You can't push so hard or you just lose all the energy I from see. what's known as radiation, uh, uh, bremsstrahlung is a German word. But basically, as the particle goes in a turn, it actually shoots off a bunch of energy in the form of radiation. So it doesn't you go like straight. Going you don't shoot off that energy. You don't lose it. Right. So you don't. there are advantages and disadvantages. And there is a proposal, actually, to build the next collider, which would be a linear collider um, with something like you know, legs that are 30 kilometers long in one direction and 30 kilometers long in another dire direction. Um, so we'll see if that is, can be built. It's a kind of a hefty price tag at the moment. Yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> and speaking of that, you know, the, the attempt to build one of these things and sort of own it in the United States and Texas years mm -hmm. ago and so on, and Congress voted it down and uh, it ultimately after they got it started and, I mean, got started building and stuff. Um, do you expect that you're going to have huge uh, international projects around this sort of thing by necessity in the future? Yes, is, is, I think that's, that's, that, that's clear. Right, and okay. CERN is a great example of that. So at CERN, there are 20 member states. And in fact, if one of them, if their politics dictates that they can't participate and they're going to pull out, then it is, it's disappointing, of course, mm -hmm. but it's not a catastrophe. People, and in exactly. fact, this happened. Austria threatened the point pull out a few years ago. And everybody was like, oh, don't go. Yes. And, and they turned out they didn't go. But it's not going to end the project at CERN. Right. right. And there's also the US, for instance, has observer status. And we also contribute a lot in terms of resources and financially to, to CERN, especially the experiments themselves. Right. But it makes um, it all more doable, But it makes it, it more doable and it makes it a bit more robust. Yes. Um, I see that. Yeah. So 
uh, because it's very hard to find you know the long-term commitment you need you know 20 30 years to build one of these things that really pushes the frontier the Hubble Space Telescope is another great exactly, example yes a long-term project that you need to be able to support that whole time it, and so that that's a little bit hard to come by Right. Um, when people think of this as, as a luxury. Exactly. I don't think it's a luxury. It isn't I think a luxury you absolutely anymore. need to do this right. kind of... I mean, we'll uh, definitely know. come back to, to this. That's mm -hmm. a very important point. But I got off a little bit there. I meant to ask mm -hmm. you about doing the data now. So it's certain, okay, so you bang these things together. Oh, yeah, so you bang those things together. Show us and then these you have pretty to pictures. measure them. So <laughs> what we have is essentially a... Uh, uh, what, you, what you can think of it as is as a, as a hundred megapixel camera, right, that is 20 meters long and 15 meters tall, and it has a bunch of different filters on it. So, you know, those are actually the sub-detectors are the different filters that measure different aspects of the event, and it clicks at 40 megahertz, or once every 25 nanoseconds. So that is a huge amount of data to be moving that fast, right? Um, and so then we have to make up a whole, you know, series of high-speed electronics to be able to from that original data sample of you know uh, 40 million events a second, we throw out one, or we, sorry, we keep one out of say 10,000 that ha contains the most interesting physics to us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that has to be all done in the matter of microseconds. Then you go to the next level, and then you have milliseconds to look at the remaining interesting stuff in more detail and find out what is really the most interesting mm -hmm. events. And from there, you can actually write that to a disk, because that's what disk speeds <coughs> allow these days. So that's the whole online process. And along with this goes a lot of you know, monitoring and power supplies and temperature monitoring and control and humidity control and safety systems. And you know, the enterprise is enormous. Exactly. So, exactly. But it's a lot of that sifting that's instantaneous. Yeah, there's a so lot of that, that sifting. With, a, mm -hmm. with the data. And then what happens to this? Then you, write, you have uh, disks and you store petabytes and petabytes of data on disk at various places around the globe, actually not just at CERN, but at right. Fermilab in Illinois, for instance, as well. Uh, and then the person who wants to do an analysis decides, what is the signature of the physics I'm looking for? Right. If I'm looking for Higgs, yeah. maybe I'm looking for its particular decay to two things called Z bosons, which then decay to electrons and muons. So I write some software that sifts through the data and looks for these particular kinds of events. And I take that piece of software, maybe that takes you know, depending on if you're bootstrapping off somebody else's code or if you're writing it from scratch, it can take weeks to months. Um, you test it all out, and then you submit it to the, what's known as the grid, right? Which okay. is essentially a mechanism for telling your job, your, your program, I want to look for this kind of data. You tell me where it's stored. You go off, ship the, the program to that location, run it on that data, and just return to me the results. So, I may sit at my you know, computer at MIT, and I may submit my job, and the job goes off to Taiwan, or it goes off to Italy, or it goes <laughs> off to Germany, and it runs on the data sample is actually resident there, or it goes to Fermilab maybe, and then my results come back to me. So there's this whole network of computing, distributed computing that we've built at the L to, to handle the analysis that has to be done at the LHC. And running over all the data, depending on how clever you are with your cuts and identifying <laughs> things can also take, you know, it can be um, you know, a few days to two weeks. It also depends on how many slots, how many computers you get running at the same time on the I data. I see. That sort of thing. I see. And then if it's something like the Higgs where you need to verify and it seems as though, well, you've got these parameters here to there or something like that, then how long does it take to well, verify that takes it. a long time too. I mean, uh, first of all, I should say that there is no single one person in my experiment who is doing the Higgs, right? right we have right. many, many people exactly. who are all, we have redundancy in terms of analyses, we have people right. cross checking other people. So, you know, there's probably 400 people all trying to measure the same things, maybe in different channels, that sort right. of thing. Right, right. So, um, and then our scrutiny process, we actually have to get it through our collaboration first before we let any results go public. And that is where you face your peers who are also your biggest critics. Yes. Right? So there is an enormous amount of cross-checking and making sure that it's consistent in this channel and this channel and these people see the same thing. And you, even down to counting, did you remember the exact same number of events and are they the exact same events as, these, as this other team who is working on the same thing? And that process uh, can also take 
you know, maybe a month or so, maybe longer. It depends on if it's a high priority analysis, right. a result we want to get out right away, right. or if it's something that uh, is not so, say, controversial or won't make headlines in the New York Times, that yeah, sort of thing. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Some subtle things, yes. right. But in the, so on the public side, you know, the non-specialist side, mm -hmm. we can be pretty sure when they say something is the Higgish that, in fact, it is the Higgish. Yes, okay. yes. I mean, in that, so... Uh, that's why you know some people will say, well, they're hiding their results. We're not really <laughs> hiding our results. Right. We're just making sure that exactly. we trust our results before we, uh, you know, spread them out among, among the public. Right. And in this case, we have sort of the gold standard from two different experiments that say what we found. Well, we found a new particle, something that we didn't know was there before. Right. Whether it's the Higgs or not. Well, we sort of have to look at it and make sure it has all the properties that a Higgs okay. boson should have. So that's why it's Higgs-ish. Yes. It's certainly consistent, but we have to check. And right. so right now we're in the process of checking whether this new thing has all the, pro uh, has all the properties we would expect from a Higgs boson before we can give it that name without the ish. Right. Now, you've talked about this, this army of highly specialized people, and I'm wondering, as an experimentalist, what does that bode for future training of, of say, particle physicists who want to work in this uh, kind of a field? I mean, what does that mean? If you have specialized kinds of training, what, what goes on now? What can people expect? Um, well, I think that... It, well, it's, it's certainly hard in terms of, um, you know, uh, certainly there are fewer and fewer of these types of experiments. And that's partly because they require so much resource and so much time uh, that, you know, you, 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 it takes a while to even get the technology base in mm. one place to actually build something like yeah, this. Yeah. Right. And so what that means is that if you want to be a particle physicist these days, CERN is sort of the only game in town. Mm. Um, and there are people who are doing other things. You can use a different. You can use natural accelerators that would be, you know, cosmic processes, mm. and you can look for particles coming uh, in the form of cosmic rays right. and try right. to do discoveries there. That's particle astrophysics. Right. And there are trade-offs. You know, the accelerator never breaks down when it's nature. It's always there. Um, on the other hand, the rate is much, much lower. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's not as easy to tell how the, the, the initial state, we would say, were, was prepared because you don't really know where these things came from. You're just looking for them. Right. So some people turn in that direction. Um, but I think, you know, uh, it, it's getting more difficult to, to do these kind of experiments to both. In, uh, I think, so the accelerators are working well. I always say this about the LHC. The accelerator is working very well. It's delivered plenty of data for us. We're very happy with it. Uh, the detector is also working surprisingly well, um, to my mind. I would have thought we'd have a few more bumps in the road mm -hmm, than we have with mm -hmm. the detector, but we haven't. Something so complicated. The tricky part is getting all the people <laughs> going in the same direction. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of my colleagues have said, you know, we are a collaboration of 2,000 or 3,000 people. There's no CEO. There's no boss, <laughs> right? So right. these people are always trying to work together, and there right. is some sort of organization, right. but no one has necessarily uh, command of everybody else right. or has the ability to fire anybody. Yes. So the fact that we get anything done at all is somehow a mirac yeah, miraculous Yeah, exactly, <laughs> which is something to look at. I mean, you know, maybe yeah. you shouldn't spread the word yeah, that I there's well, nobody We do charge. all have one goal. I mean, we're all interested exactly. in the physics in the are. end. And, and exactly. you know, when people get competitive about whose result is <laughs> yeah. actually going to be the one, <laughs> right. then you sit back and you say, well, it's really about the physics because that's what we want to learn. We rise It doesn't above really it. matter yes. who actually <laughs> produced it because, okay. I mean, in these situations, many different people could produce the same result. But what, uh, one of the things I wanted to find out was that when you were preparing, when you were working on your doctorate, mm -hmm. you were involved with people who were right in the middle of everything. Is that, for your students now, is that uh, still a possibility? It is a possibility. Yes. And I would say that, you know, it, it's not that the LHC suddenly we changed how things yeah. worked. This has been going on for a, a while in particle physics. The collaboration I worked on, you know, 20 years ago, 
had maybe a few hundred people. The collaboration I worked on 10 years ago had maybe closer to 1,000, mm -hmm. and now we're up to 2,500, 3,000 or something like that. So it's been kind of an evolution in this mm -hmm. direction. And that's just because as you get the higher energy, the things get more complicated, you get fewer of them, and people sort of congregate together, both to pool the resources and because there are fewer places to do things. Yeah. So, you know, and it, it is possible. I mean, we send our students over to the lab, and they work there for a few years. Um, but it's getting harder. It's getting mm -hmm. harder to do that. Geneva is not a cheap place to go to, yes, actually. True. So <laughs> right. Um, it, right. it's getting more difficult. And we worry also about students getting the full experience. Building these detectors only happens right. once every two decades, three decades. So how do you train your students? And in fact, the American Physical Society's uh, Department of, of Particles and Fields has brought this up and has a special program to try to give students opportunities to learn the the hardware side of the techniques we use, because not just the software side. Exactly, you can't just sit back and think. Well, about, yeah, and you right. don't, don't want to give the student the detector while it's taking data and say, "Yeah, play with it." You can't <laughs> have them do that, right? So, be a uh, thought. So <laughs> <laughs> that would be a thought. Okay, then I want to ask also uh, b about the future, just in general. You've already mentioned these things are supersize kinds mm -hmm. of machines; they're mm -hmm. very expensive, and so on. Um, what is the future for what they will be looking for, for what this, I'm assuming we're going to stay with this machine, and what can be looking for, so, and I wanted to touch on supersymmetry when we get in here too. Yeah, so yeah. The, the, the danger here is, that, so we say, oh, we found something, and everybody said, good, you're done. <laughs> no, we're not done. <laughs> right, In fact, starts. First, we want to study it. We want to yeah. make sure it has all the properties and yeah. everything we expect, because it could be, that this is the first of a few things that we find. Yes. And then it's not the Higgs's boson anymore, it's something more. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, that's, that's goal number one, is study this as much as possible. And in fact, this year's data taking plan was built precisely for that, to try to get as much data as we could before we go through the shutdown uh, to I really see. nail it down. Right. So the second thing is it's not the end of the story. So even if you have a Higgs boson, it actually still causes problems with theories that start exploding, predicting probabilities greater than 100%. And there are ways to fix this, many different ways that involve more new particles. One of the most popular ones is what you mentioned called supersymmetry, yeah. or people call Susie. it SUSY for short. Um, and the problem with the Higgs is, if I can describe this using a, a, a kind of a ludicrous analogy, right, is that you have contributions to its mass. Its mass we measure now. And we know it has this finite value. You have these enormous contributions on one side driving it positive. You have some enormous contributions to its mass driving it negative. And these just magically cancel out. It's like yeah. throwing 3,000 elephants on one side of the seesaw and 9,452 rhinos on the other side of the seesaw, and it just perfectly balances. Seems a little unnatural to mm -hmm. us. Unless there's a mechanism underneath that causes that, you know, Di basically forces this cancellation. Mm -hmm. Supersymmetry was invented, at least the way I learned it, to actually solve this particular problem. You, for every particle, mm -hmm. you invent a supersymmetric partner to a particle, which gives you an equal and opposite mm -hmm. contribution. Mm -hmm. So all those positive contributions get an equal and opposite, mm -hmm. uh, so get a negative contribution of equal strength, and the negative ones get a positive one of equal strength. And so it's sort of built in the cancellation is, you know, the fix is in. Mm -hmm. It's built in. But it is fixed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, supersymmetry also has some other very attractive properties. We haven't talked about it, but there's this mm -hmm. idea of dark matter. Yes. What is dark That's matter? the next question. So dark matter, <laughs> right. we don't really know what it is. Yeah. We know it interacts gravitationally because of the way that the stars and galaxies are moving. They're moving uh, too fast, way out there, for there right. not to be some more mass. But we can't see it. It doesn't interact with light. So we call it dark. It's dark and it's matter because it interacts gravitationally. Maybe one of the, uh, the, the, the slew of supersymmetric particles have enough mass that they could be candidates oh, for the particulate form of dark matter, right? So, and in fact, there's you know, a nice little confluence of theories where at the scale that you can measure with the LHC, if there is uh, supersymmetric particle, it could solve this dark, dark matter problem. It's, it's in the realm of possibility. It's in the right ballpark on all sides. Um, and the other thing is sort of an esoteric thing that theorists and, and, well, physicists, I should say, like, which is we know that at some high energy, actually, the electromagnetic force and the weak force get unified mm -hmm. into sort of one theory that when you go to low energy, sort of splits into two, mm -hmm. right? 
we would like to actually even be able to take the strong force and unify it with those. And it looks like we can do it, but not quite. They just miss, unless you add supersymmetry. And then they coalesce at some very high energy I scale. See. So this is sort of a, I mean, this is our reductionist you know, physicist. We like to be reductionists. Right, we like right, to think right, that there right. is one theory, which then, if you take it to one extreme, becomes maybe three. Right. So supersymmetry also has that added feature to it that people like. And that can be, the, the LHC can be the, the source that will help it you could. get to the bottom of now, that. Now, the difference between the Higgs and supersymmetry is the Higgs has to lie within a certain range of masses. Otherwise, well, below, we've looked. We don't see right, it there. Right. Above, the theory doesn't make any sense. Right, There's no okay. reason to have a Higgs. Um, the LHC covers that whole range. Right. Okay. Supersymmetry. Below, we've looked, we don't see it, but there's no upper bound. So it could always be that, well, the LHC just doesn't have enough energy to right. produce supersymmetric particles. Right. Um, if that's the case, then we need a higher energy machine. And that is what people will be excited about when right. we go through the shutdown and come back at a higher energy. Right. And on this, then, we're higher energy machines and mm -hmm. so on, and looking into uh, the future and winding down here, then you know we are trying in this organization to garner support from the public for projects in science or for science mm -hmm. in general that because science is very much in the center of modern life mm -hmm. and if we're going to figure things out we're going to figure them out pretty much through science well these kinds of projects take many years they take as you've pointed out vast numbers of people mm -hmm. and very large resources and mm -hmm. they need to be international now so do you foresee that like the support the international support for the political support wherever it is the, the that will help finance these kinds of things um, yeah I mean I, I think it's a tricky issue, and it's hard because um, you know people do see these sometimes as as luxuries. On the other hand, I go and I play soccer with my team in Arlington, and they all ask me about what's going on exactly. with the Higgs boson. So yes. it's clear that people are very interested in this, right. and and people have to you know people are interested in finding out new things about the world. Um, whether that translates into the politics of funding science for science sake is, is less clear to me, right? And people ask, well, what, what does a place like CERN bring you? And so I have some answers. For, well, one is yeah. innovation, yes. right? People say it costs a lot of money, actually, to run these things. And that's true, but it is spread out over decades and decades. Right. And it does and produce it produces stuff, right. other stuff. So that the canonical example of this is the fact that in order to get scientists to communicate with scientists. There was a guy named Tim Berners-Lee. Yes. <laughs> and he <laughs> coined the terms World Wide Web, That's right. uh, Uniform Research Locator, whatever yeah, URL well, stands yeah, for, right. HTML. Yes. Right. The reason you know about those things, the reason those came into existence was because of science for science sake. Exactly. Yes. Right. So if you say CERN is expensive, I will ask you, what do you think the internet is worth? Exactly. And because that's one of the payoffs. Exactly. Um, there are other examples. There's a lot of examples. There's right. proton therapy centers, uh, which are good for treating cancer because they deposit the energy in a localized place around the tumor and not right. in a bunch of other healthy tissue near the tumor. Right. right. These things are being built by lots of hospitals. Who knows how to move protons around, steer them around, make magnets that you can use to do these things. Uh, that would come out of actually the research that is for CERN. Right. So there's innovation. Right. There's there's also expertise. Right. Yes. I have friends who don't stay in particle physics, but they go off and they run uh, the isotope production plant at, in Mass General Hospital, so that people can undergo you know uh, diagnostic radioactive therapy treatment and and diagnosis. Right. Because they know how to run accelerators and know how to produce isotopes. Uh, I have friends who look for oil with neutrons. I have friends who <laughs> go off to Wall Street and apply some of these uh, Don't algorithms. Don't talk about that. Right? Right oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we're, I have to mention them. Hopefully, that. they're listening. Um, no, we're you know, there's. Uh, I have a friend who who works on uh, luggage scanners. Right. That's a lot like a particle right. physics experiment. You take a quick picture. You look to see if there are any illicit items in the luggage, and you want the best yes, resolution. You want to make yes. the decision very fast. Right. It's re very relevant. 
So there's all sorts of expertise that's right. generated from all this. these things spill out yeah. of it. But it's also the future, and it is true that if we're going to go into space, that we're going to need telescopes, we're going to need all of these kinds of things, and to get down, drive down, and to find out what reality is, then we're this yeah. is the way well, that's that the it's going to do it. it. We don't have options like there's not some tiny thing we can use here. Yeah, yeah. There's no right. there's no direct killer app for the Higgs boson, right? right? <laughs> there was no direct killer app for the electron good. either. 100 yes, years ago, this is true. when <laughs> J.J. <laughs> Thompson yes. discovered the electron. Yes. And now look at how many things we can do Absolutely. because we can move the electron around. Exactly. So what the payoff will be 50, 100 years from now, you really don't know. Uh, no one would have predicted uh, uh, 50 or 100 years ago what we have today, I would it's guess. It's amazing. So, it's really amazing. It's true, just mm -hmm. 50 years ago, but think even 100 years ago, the, dis the difference is just staggering of what we know today. And we in the public hope we can catch up with, <laughs> with the information. Uh, Dr. Nan, thank you very much for sure. giving us this wonderful information. I'll turn it over, let you all ask a few questions until they throw us out. Thank you very much. Thank you. There, if there is a fundamental difference there between a field and a particle, uh, should I should I then also assume that there's a fundamental? I think the answer is to is yes to all your questions. It's germane. Okay. There is a Higgs field and a Higgs particle, so the Higgs boson is the excitation of the Higgs field. It's the Higgs field that permeates everything, and that but the boson is actually sort of the it, 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 if you think of like a surface of water. Right? That's the field. A wave is an excitation on the surface of the water. Right? So that is sort of in uh, sort of the simplest picture I can conceive of, an analogy to what the Higgs boson is versus the Higgs field. But yeah, I mean, these things are built on quantum field theory, so the theories of, of actual fields interacting. Um, just like in electromagnetism, there was a field, an electric field and a magnetic field. But the way we, we envision uh, sort of the Higgs as an excitation of the field is the same way we think of the photon as representing the electric and magnetic fields as well. Okay, so the problem here is how could the Higgs particle be massive without the property of massiveness? Yeah, no, this is tricky. Um, it's because the Higgs can interact with itself. And this is different than electromagnetism. Yeah. You think of a photon as not charged, right? So it doesn't interact with itself. It interacts with charged particles like protons and electrons. The Higgs itself is, to some extent, charged. So it interacts with itself, and it gives itself mass as well. So there is no chicken and egg as long as you can have this self-interaction. Um, maybe a little technical. Sorry. <laughs> but it does derive the, the, the Higgs boson does have a property that we call mass. Yes. And you're saying it derives that property from itself. Essentially, yes. Oh, wow. Wow. Is there a Higgs field in this room? Yes. hundred years from now, I could detect it. Yes. Does it have a gradient? Ooh, good question. Um, uh, does it mean? Does it change in space and and as you as you move from here to there? Um, well, that I don't know. Uh, I have to think what my equations tell me about it. I, I, you know, I don't know that anybody's thought to ask the question of does the field have a gradient. I, I would guess it does. Um, but it's supposed to pervade all space and time. If it has a gradient, it's kind of hard to, to talk about gradients the way you talk about like a gradient in a temperature field yeah. with the Higgs. This is a quantum field theory, so <laughs> not sure that it, it makes sense on, on that scale, right? Um, I'm asking you. I know. <laughs> well, I'm thinking for you right now. So, <laughs> I mean, I think you can say yes. It definitely, you know, if I, I'm, I'm picturing the quantum field theory language of how they actually encapsulate the Higgs in, in quantum field theory, and there is a gradient involved there. Yes. Um, whether you could actually measure such a gradient, I think not. But if I could measure a Higgs field with my Higgs photometer 100 years from now, doesn't that imply a gradient if I'm able to measure it? If it were totally uniform forever, like the ether. Yeah, why would it be there? The yeah, 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 yeah. Why would it be there? Um, I think you can measure the Higgs field, but you wouldn't see it that way. What you would do is you would probably be able to, I mean, you know, the fact that things have mass would tell you that there's a Higgs field. 
right? Um, you mean you could infer it? I think you'd have to infer it, but it's not clear to me that unless you had, yeah, I don't think you would have the ability to actually see a Higgs boson. I don't know. This is this is uh, know. quite speculative. So maybe I would say. Yeah. Oh, you know. So then the, you know. The, the rather expensive experiments, uh, quite apart from LHC, that are proposed are underway to detect the projected existence of gravity waves. Would that uh, affect your understanding of the Higgs boson? No. I think not. I mean, gravity waves. Uh, I, I think I said this before. Gravity we don't really talk about in so much in quantum field theory. I mean, there are ideas about a graviton, but um, that is very different than gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are caused by really huge, massive objects like black holes colliding and sending out these waves. And you need something that big to make a gravitational wave because gravity is so weak. So Higgs mass is really about the rest mass of particles, where gravitational waves has more to do with gravitational mass and how gravity interacts and actually changes. Well, this is, I don't want to go there because this is not a talk about gravity, and I'm not an expert on gravity. But uh, gravity mass itself, gravitational mass, changes the shape of, of space time. And that's what these waves are. Um, so they're really quite disjoint, I would say. There's, there's no way you can start with Higgs and you get to gravitational waves. Einstein made a significant contribution, infinitely small, but infinitely large. A need? Um, I don't know. We might be branching into metaphysics here, actually, right? Um, I, I'm an experimentalist, so I make observations and, and see what is there, as opposed to saying we absolutely need to have a unified theory. We like it. And we see examples of this already. I mentioned one before, where electromagnetism unifies with uh, uh, the, the weak force, essentially, um, where we can see them as both coming from a single source. So if you could do that with then the strong force as well, and then you could do that with gravity, even though we don't have a quantum field theory of gravity even that we understand, um, then you would have one. But I don't think you absolutely need it, right? It's sort of a different philosophy, if you like. Some people could say, well, yeah, there must be something that underlies everything that you can take and just go this way. And, and in fact, these theories have a lot of the same mathematical concepts over and over again. So they are very similar. Um, but they're, they each have their own foibles. And it's not clear to me that there has to be a unified theory. But perhaps it's desirable. Um, I think certain people would like to see it happen. I think other people probably don't care. <laughs> um, so, you know. But I wonder if Einstein cared. I mean, uh, he cared, I think, yes. Yeah, he certainly would care. I don't know whether he had a preference um, or whether he would have thought, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, but, but he would have certainly been interested in the question, for sure. wondering if you're only finding the things that you're looking for, if the parameters... That, that is a very <laughs> tricky question, yes. And so my basic question is, is there enough computing power available to you to process all, absolutely all of the data from at least one... So, but there's a slight distinction with your, with your interpretation, which is we look at the entire event we just don't look at every single event that happens, right? Okay. So the filtering doesn't happen. I mean, we, as much information as we can get, and even th the fact that we use things like energy balance to infer that there are particles that we couldn't see going that way because otherwise the energy wouldn't balance. So we look at every single, we look at every aspect of the event that we have a detector built to see. And by event, that is a collision. A collision. But the problem is we cannot deal with the slew of collisions that are coming at us. So what we have to do is build up something that says, OK, in this event, there's a bunch of energy there and what looks to be like a muon over there. So let's keep it and look at it some more. And then at the next level, we say, OK, that energy, we get a better resolution on it. Plus, we see some more things here that we have time to reconstruct. And that muon looks like a really good muon. And it has a sister muon over here. Let's really keep this. And then it goes to tape. 
Not only that, so we, that's called a trigger system. And you're right, you build it so that you select what you think is the most interesting physics. So you could be blind to something that you are totally not expected to see. On the other hand, we're not that dumb. We also, every once in a while, take an event no matter what. We just say, take this event, right? So if there is prevalent new physics out there that doesn't satisfy our filters, it should end up in that sample because we don't even use our biases in, in those. So we try to keep an eye out for that, right? But the fact is, to you know, uh, these events happen once every 10 billion. A Higgs event is once every 10 billion events, right? So you really have to do the filtering. You cannot take 10 billion and you know all at once and then keep looking. See? So, sure. Yeah. Has there ever been a proven occurrence of proton decay? No, and we're looking. And they're still looking, yes. Absolutely. And uh, does negative mean something? Does The fact that they haven't seen it yet. Um, yes, you can rule out certain theories that would predict that protons decay. Suppose that, you know, like quarks uh, and, and leptons actually come from something even smaller that we can't see, right? Then you could have a proton made of quarks, but those quarks could decay to this smaller thing, and that might disappear. So those kind of theories actually are ruled out by the fact that we don't see proton decay. Um, and the limit on proton decay is the lifetime is something like 10 to the 33 years, which is well beyond the lifetime of our universe. Which is why you need um, a big vat of water. <laughs> exactly. And they have enormous vats of water uh, where they look for proton decay, because you just need a lot of stuff. Yes? so much. I've got to let you sure. go. I can Definitely go out and I'm, I'm happy to talk in the hallway if people have more questions. And you had an interesting family. That's uh, unusual, I believe. Well, okay. So I, I originally, um, well, actually I was born in Germany, but we moved there, away from there after I was three months old uh, and settled in the Midwest in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and, and my family, I think that's actually part of the reason why I, I'm in physics. I am the seventh of eight kids. Isn't um, that something? Which wow. is, yes, uh, quite a household to grow up in, a little different than most other people. Yeah. And so part of the reason I think I chose to go into physics, well, first of all, it interests me. And, and certainly uh, I had a certain talent for it. So it was always interesting to, to explore how the world works in the most fundamental way. I probably every scientist you have says that their scientist is the most fundamental, but physicists yes. really believe that we're the most <laughs> fundamental science and everything derives from us. And then the mathematics mathematicians come in and start talking about <laughs> them. But okay, fine. Anyway, um, part of me thinks that you know a lot of what I did when I was growing up and making decisions was just to do something different than the rest of my siblings. You know, there was already a doctor and an engineer <laughs> and a lawyer and an advertising guy. Amazing and, you know, family. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, but none of them had done academia and certainly none of them had done physics. Uh, and most of them get scared when I start talking about it now. Yes. But, um, so, th so I grew up in this big family in, in Madison and I got my undergraduate degree there in physics, um, working actually in a space physics project <gasps> um, to study the soft X-ray background. Uh, with a sounding rocket. That was very fun mm. and I learned a lot of great engineering and, and apparatus skills, you know, how to actually put together a detector there. Uh, and then I came actually out to Boston and I did my graduate work at MIT. Mm -hmm. where that's where I really started in particle physics. Um, so I took classes at MIT and eventually uh, moved over to CERN even as a graduate student and, and lived there for three years uh, with my wife working on uh, it's actually the predecessor to the uh, Large yeah. Hadron Collider called the Large Electron-Positron Collider. Yes. The same tunnel, yeah. Uh, yeah. just colliding electrons and positrons rather than protons and protons. Um, and that's where I did my PhD, where we studied, uh, we, we went up to the highest energy possible, uh, and we studied uh, production of pairs of Ws. First time could you produce yes. pairs of Ws. That was my thesis topic as well as a lot of other things. We also searched for supersymmetry, and we searched for the Higgs. Yeah. Uh, we didn't find it because we didn't have enough energy. Yeah. Um, so after that, uh, I decided, uh, that detector I kind of inherited. I didn't actually build it. I didn't have a role in building it. It was built and running when I got there. Mm -hmm. So I decided I wanted to play a role in actually putting something together mm -hmm. again, and I went to the Tevatron, which was just in the middle of a fairly long shutdown to upgrade its uh, 
uh, interaction rate and upgrade the detectors uh, called Run, Tempatron Run 2. And there I really got involved in building a detector again uh, and eventually r ran that detector and studied the, flavor, the physics of the B quark there. Um, and then I decided to come back to MIT. Yeah. So uh, they offered me a position, and I came back to MIT, and that's when I got involved in the compact muon solenoid, which is the current detector, one of the two big detectors at right. the LHC yeah. that's responsible right. for this you know, beautiful new measurement of the Higgs-ish boson. Right. I, we hope by the end of the year we can take the ish off of that. Yes. Right. <laughs> but uh, were you involved in the actual building of the, the design of the CMS2? Uh, not so much, because I got there, again, a little late, so the yeah. design was already in place. Uh, but we were really in the throes of putting the detector together, uh, you know, so you assemble it in pieces, and actually. drop it in the ground. Yeah, drop it in the ground. Well, n drop it is, well. maybe not drop, that's probably not the right <laughs> verb to use. Lower it gently down <laughs> to the ground. Um, it no, descended. But yeah, so, so I was involved a lot in the integration of the detector yeah, and in establishing the first operations. Um, and as I described to you before, this is like a, uh, you know, uh, a, a hundred megapixel camera that's taking pictures once every 25 nanoseconds, so at 40 megahertz. Yeah. So getting all of those things firing all at the same time, making sure every piece of your detector is looking at the same event at the yeah. same time, the synchronization, the calibration, it, it's a huge effort. And yes. it wasn't just me, right? right it was right. me and a, a bunch of other people. But to uh, work on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was right. really, really fun. I was over there for uh, 15 months in 2006, 2007, and since then, Actually, most of my group is there keeping the detector running and analyzing right, the data, right, and I right. hop back and forth between teaching at MIT and, and, and going there. And what's your main focus these days? You did all this work on the W before, and uh, is it, do you just progress right along? Do, you, do people, well, what do you do? Um, so my main focus is, has been on, on this Higgs boson. Um, Partly, I mean, the LHC, the great thing about it is you're taking such a big step up in energy mm. that there's a huge amount of different things, a plethora of things you could actually explore, mm -hmm. right? You can go look for brand new particles that aren't predicted. You can try to solve this Higgs problem, which is sort of the last, you know, corner piece of the standard model that we mm -hmm. haven't really mm -hmm. solidified mm -hmm. yet. Uh, you can study heavy flavor physics, the physics of the B quark, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. instance. You can look, it's a top factory, so it, it like cranks out top quarks like crazy. And there are good reasons to look at them because they're so heavy compared to the other ones that maybe new physics will show up there first. There's just a whole slew of things you can do. It's like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. Um, I picked Higgs probably because of my upbringing in, you know, sort of the, <coughs> at, at the large electron positron collider as a graduate student mm -hmm. and at the Tevatron. Those were sort of the, the seminal measurements that really solidified our understanding of the standard model. So, mm -hmm. so, so sort of, to me, the most satisfying thing to do would say, is this, you know, model of uh, weak interactions, electromagnetic interactions, strong interactions, it needs something like this Higgs. Is that the answer? And that's why I'm studying the Higgs. Yes. And the future? <clears throat> so the future is an interesting question, right? right the mean, future right now depends a bit upon what we find at the LHC. Mm -hmm. And this Higgs is a, is a great start because it, in fact, gives us, you know, if everything which has mass couples to the Higgs, then suppose that you make something which produces lots and lots of Higgses and you watch them decay, maybe you see something that decays too new you didn't see before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's one example of what people are thinking about these days. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can build an accelerator that is a Higgs factory. Um, and, and you'll find lots of talks on, well, I don't know, if other people go to these talks, but I see lots of talks on, you know, future accelerators to exploit that. Uh, the other question is, the Higgs is not the only thing we might find at the right. LHC. We're just sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? So again, if we find some more, if we, if we find a, a new scale where particle physics, new particles sort of emerge at a new scale, then we would target an accelerator to produce exactly that scale so mm -hmm. that we could tune it and we can really study the production of these new particles, right? Right now, it's sort of a, it's what we call a broadband machine. <coughs> when you collide protons on protons, mm -hmm. you're colliding a bag of stuff on a bag of stuff and you can end up with a whole spectrum of different energies of actual collision because you don't know what actually hit what quite precisely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you do the same thing with electrons and positrons, now it's not a bag of quarks and a bag of quarks, it's a single point particle and a single point particle and you know exactly the energy of it. And so you can study things much better. You don't get 
as good a search out of it because you have to move the energy yourself. The protons, when they're colliding, they give mm -hmm. you naturally mm -hmm. a whole spectrum of energies. Mm -hmm. So if something is sitting up here, that's within your spectrum. When you collide at electrons and positrons, if something is sitting up here and you're sitting at this energy, you won't see this, uh -huh -huh. right? So it's only after you found something that you want a machine like that to really study mm -hmm. the physics. And mm -hmm. that's what the particle physics community is talking about, is where can we build a new machine which gives us more access to this highest, higher energy regime. But you want to know where that regime exactly is mm -hmm. before you set down in stone what you're going to build. Yes, so you, you anticipate more uh, uh, colliders or another, another what, generation that of colliders. That would be the next step, another generation and of colliders. a whole lot more of particle physics. It's not, uh, it's not time to announce that's all been solved. No, and, not at all, not at yeah. all. And I think um, there's many times when we said, okay, we got, we, we got it all figured out, and then boom, quantum exactly. mechanics or relativity yeah, hit, so, and everybody exactly. said, no, we have nothing figured now out. Now people don't right? do that anymore, <laughs> right? I suppose. So I think there's, a, there's quite a bit of particle physics in the future. Yeah. Uh, now, these are long-term projects. 